What are we discussing on today's Locked on Dimebacks podcast? Did Ketel Marte do enough to earn himself the Hank Aaron Award? And what are the odds that the players with options return to the D-backs in 2025? You are Locked on Diamondbacks, your daily Arizona Diamondbacks podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Welcome into the Locked On Dimebacks podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. You're listening to who? The always charismatic host of this podcast, Miller Thomas, multimedia journalist, and graphic designer. So please go check out my website, millerthomas 24 downmyportfoliocom to see all of my latest work. Today's episode is brought to you by Booking.com. Booking. Yeah. The right stay can make you a fan of any city, even your baseball rivals. Book today on Booking.com, the official accommodation partner of Major League Baseball. Get the Booking.com app today. On today's Locked on Dimebacks podcast, we'll be talking about Ketel Marte and how he's a finalist for the Hank Aaron Award. The odds that the players on the D-backs team who have options return to the squad in 2025. And then, of course, we'll continue our player reviews with today being Ketel Marte. So a lot I want to talk to you guys on today's podcast. But first, I want to say thank you for making Locked on Dimebacks your first listen every day. I would not be able to do this podcast without you, my loyal listeners sharing, subscribing, reviewing, doing all that so I could do this podcast for you. Thank you. It's free. It's available on all platforms, so please continue to tell your friends. And one of those platforms is YouTube. Please hit subscribe to Locked on Dimebacks on YouTube. Let's get into the podcast, and let's talk about Ketel Marte and his his chances of Winning the Hank Aaron Award, because if you guys don't know about the Hank Aaron Award, it's basically goes to the guy in either league. There's two of these, one in the NL, one the AL, just like the MVP. It goes to the player who was considered the best offensive performer in each league. So this is very similar to what the NFL does. They have their MVP, then they have their offensive player of the year. And Ketel Marte is a finalist in the NL, along with Otani, Ozuna, Bryce Harper, Freddie Freeman, Kyle Schorber, Francisco Lindor, William Contreras, Jackson Merrill rookie, and Ellie De La Cruz. And I want to lay out the case for you for Ketel Marte because I think he is definitely, maybe definitely is too strong because you never know, but I think he has, I think he has the strongest case to win the Hank Aaron Award. And the first point that I'll make is, again, that comparison to the NFL because when you go look at the MVP and the Offense Player of the Year awards for those, uh, for that respective league, typically the way it goes, you have your MVP who everyone voted for, and then the guy who kind of finished runner-up for MVP wins Offense Player of the Year. Now, Ketel Marte might not finish runner-up for MVP, but I think he was clearly the second best offensive player after Shohei Otani, and that's why I think. He's probably going to win this award. It's still going to be super close with a guy like Marcel Azuna. When taking in an offensive-only award, Marcel Azuna does not have to worry about the fact that he only DHs and doesn't play in the field because for this type of award, that does not matter. It actually benefits a Marcel Azuna. But maybe it also benefits a Ketel Marte because think about it. That's a little bit more wear and tear on your body if you have to go out there and play the field. I'm hoping the voters take that into account. Think about how much more is on your muscles and your body and how much more sore it is if you have to go out there and make diving stops at second base and go out there and cover a second on double play turns and ground balls. You got to dig those out. Like there's so many different situations where you got to run around. I know I played softball this past summer and guys, after doing a little double header for a couple hours, like you wake up the next day, you're sore after just running bases. And so think about Keta Marte running around the field for 162 games. Meanwhile, Marcel Azuna gets to sit for nine innings, only has to get up three to four, five times a game to go at bat. And so definitely more wear and tear with Keta Marte than guys like Marcel Azuna, who primarily played DH. And so Otani, he's going to win the MVP award. You just pray when you look at the numbers. They say Marte was the second best offensive player, so he can get 
this Hank Aaron award because because of Marte missing games this season due to injury. I don't I don't think he'll finish runner up in MVP voting despite him probably should fin despite Marte with the numbers he put up, he probably should finish runner up in MVP voting, but I don't think it will happen because he missed you know, the 20 games only played 136, but maybe something like that actually helps him in his favor for the offense player of the year. Because for MVP, you're going to say, okay, he got hurt. He missed 20 games. Like his numbers are as comparable as anyone, but let me get the guy who is a little bit more available. That adds a little bit more value for MVP, right? But for just offense player of the year, where you just want to know black and white, who was the best offense player this year? The fact that Marte, among the finalists, has the second highest OPS bodes well in his favor. And the fact that I think he missed time also helps in his favor because Marte still put up 36 home runs and 95 RBIs. Ozuna in 20 more games. He played every single game, Marcel Ozuna. Only had three more home runs, only nine more RBIs. A guy like Kyle Schwarber, he played... Uh, 14 more games in a Marte. He only had two more home runs. Again, just nine more RBIs. Like, I truly believe if Marte played his 160 games without getting hurt, he probably would have cracked 40 home runs and maybe over 110 RBIs. Like, he probably would have been second to Otani in the home runs and the RBIs in most of those offensive categories. Also, considering Marte heated up in the second half of the season, like in the first half, you look at the numbers, he was. Clearly an all-star level player in the first half of the season. But then in the second half of the year, Marte kicked it up into overdrive and he put up superstar numbers. He put up MVP numbers in the second half. And it's disappointing that he got hurt because the, the trajectory he was on in the second half of the season, I think he would have been a lock to finish runner up in the MVP voting. But because of all the games he missed, I think that's definitely going to hurt him. And we'll see if he's even a finalist for the MVP award, which means top three in voting. So we'll even see if that happens to Marte, despite his tremendous success this year. But regardless of the games missed in the MVP award, this award is is entirely different. And I think he's played enough games to win this award. 136, I think, is definitely enough games. Also, considering with 136 games played, his numbers are still as good as anyone on the list. He's still fourth overall in RBIs. He's still fourth overall in home runs. If, if he played 160 games and he had 36 home runs and 95 RBIs, it would have been an insane season. The fact that he did it in only 136 I think you have to give the MVP to Marte. The fact that by the numbers, it looks like he was the second best offense player. The fact that he also had to play the field and he played some great defense this year. I think you have to give it to Marte as well. Kept on Marte. If he didn't get hurt, he might have easily ran away with second place in MVP voting because right before he got injured, he was running away with the runner up in the fan duel voting odds. So Kept on Marte. I pray you get awarded with the Hank Aaron Award this offseason. Now I want to talk to you guys about the odds that the players with options on the D-backs come back in 2025. But hey, if you want to place a little wager down on an upcoming NFL game, then the place you want to do that is going to be FanDuel because, hey, NFL fans, you can start this season with a big return on FanDuel, America's number one sports book. So when you get a hunch in the middle of the game, you can check out the latest stats, view live play-by-play, -play, and so much more on the same page where you place your bets. My favorite thing to do on FanDuel is the same game parlay. Give me Saints money line. Camara over on total receptions and give me Chris Olave over on touchdowns. When that three leg hits, it brings a big smile to my face. And if you want a big smile on your face, go to FanDuel.com. And right now, you'll get started with $200 in bonus bets guaranteed when you place your first $5 bet. That's FanDuel.com, America's number one sports book. And also, if you're looking to purchase tickets to an upcoming game, then the best place you want to go is going to be game time because game time, actually, they have more than just sporting events. They're the best place for
for last minute tickets for sports, concerts, comedy, theater, and more. They have this feature called All In Pricing. When you toggle that feature on, you can see your total cost up front with no surprise fees at checkout. You can get a panoramic view from your seat before you buy. They also have the lowest price guarantee or game time will credit you 110% of the difference. Take the guesswork out of buying tickets with Game Time. Download the Game Time app, create an account, and use code Lockdown MLB for twenty dollars off your first purchase. Terms apply. Again, create an account and redeem code Lockdown MLB for twenty dollars off. Download Game Time today. What time is it? Game time. All right, all right, all right. Let's get back into the Locked On Diamondbacks podcast and let's. Put some percentages next to the dudes who have options for the D-backs. The percentages that, because there's three categories of options, right? Club options, which is totally in the team control. If they pick it up, that player is returning next season. You got player options entirely in the player's control. If the player picks it up, he's come to the team. He's come back to the team next season. And then there's mutual options, meaning both sides have to pick it up. And so we're going to be putting percentages next to each player with an option on their odds of returning to the D-backs in 2025. The first guy we're going to talk about is under the club options. A. Eugenio Suarez, $15 million club option, 33 years old, coming off a really strong season where he had one of the most electric second halves we've ever seen in Major League history. A 788 OPS on the season with the 30 home runs and 100 RBIs. We'll take all that. For the D-backs right now, when looking at the third base market, this free agency not looking very good. When you look at the D-backs internal options for third base, I guess you could go Lawler at shortstop, Perdomo at third if you want, but Lawler's always hurt, so I don't think you have that level of trust in him right now. Considering A. Eugenio had a great year, the market looks bad, you don't have a lot of great internal options. I think it's at 90% chance the D-backs pick up a Eugenio's. The last 10% is because there is a little possibility that the D-backs try to cut back some of their payroll. They try to get a little bit cheaper, missing out on the postseason. You don't get any extra revenue. I think that is going to come back to hurt the D-backs this offseason. And so, I'm very curious to see who the D-backs are going to bring back, how much money they're going to spend this offseason, and A. Eugenio could just be a casualty of the D-backs cutting back, but I would put it at a 90% chance he will be on the D-backs roster next year. Another guy, Merrill Kelly, $7 million club option, going to be 36 years old. He has been really good during his time in Arizona. Six seasons, a 3-2 ERA with 140 starts. He was incredible in the postseason that whole year. He was really good. And Merrill Kelly, when he's healthy, if he if I get 180 innings out Merrill Kelly, I'm confident he's going to look like a frontline starter. I think when talking about attitude and dudes have that dog in him, I don't know if anyone exemplifies it more than Merrill Kelly, Uh, a true emotional leader. Uh, Actions speak louder than words with Merrill Kelly. And so I think the D-backs have to bring him back next season. He will be the D-backs number two starter, no doubt in the rotation. And considering it's only $7 million for a guy who's been one of the heartbeats of this D-backs franchise over the last half decade plus, I think you have to bring bring back Merrill Kelly. Who can you get this free agency, trade market, signing, whatever, for $7 million? That's as good as Merrill Kelly in your rotation. You cannot. I'm putting at 99% chance, maybe, and when I say 99, it's like 99.99999, like infinity, right? Because I think Merrill Kelly is definitely coming back to the team next year. I would be mind blown if the D-backs don't pick up a $7 million option on your number two starter. How about a guy with a player option? Jordan Montgomery. We've already seen Ken Kendrick. Go out there and do the press tour of trying to make sure Jordan Montgomery doesn't pick up the option. He's saying all the right things in the press. That decision was on me. Not just decision. Ken Kendrick went on the radio and said that horrible decision was on me. It was my call. 
I made the decision to I made the horrible decision to go out there and sign Jordan Montgomery. So Ken Kendrick is doing everything in his power to make sure Monty doesn't pick up his twenty two and a half million dollar player option. But I got to say, I think it's 85 percent chance Monty comes back, if not higher, because twenty two and a half million is so much money. And who is going to give Monty that contract this offseason? Now, if Monty wants to, he can go out there, decline the option, and then probably sign for a lesser deal, maybe like seven, eight million dollars. But it could be a one year prove it deal where if you have a great season, then the very next year you could probably get paid in free agency. But right now, no one is going to give him twenty two and a half million, maybe fifteen, but twenty two and a half million dollars after a six, two, three year reign, twenty five appearances this past year. I don't think anyone is going to do that. So I'll say for Jordan Montgomery, it's an 85% chance, if not higher, he picks up his player option because who else is going to give him that money? And he still has an opportunity for a role here with the D-backs next season. It should be a battle between him and Erod and Ryan Nelson for those last three spots in the rotation because Ryan Nelson was too good this year to not be one of those starters. And I guess Erod is probably more locked in than Monty, considering he's still got three years left on his deal. But Erod did not do himself a lot of favors to D-backs fans this year. So if he does not have a healthy offseason and spring training where we get to day one of the regular season, that would not feel good to D-backs fans at all for Erod's prospects for next year. And then these are the players with mutual options. Both sides have to pick it up. Jock Peterson, $14 $14 million option with a $3 million buyout. Uh, the, the numbers tell you most mutual options don't get picked up because if you're a guy like Jock Peterson, who just had himself a fantastic year, 23 home runs, 908 OPS, why would you pick up $14 million? Maybe it's the most you could get if you're Jock Peterson on the open market, but you also might be able to get more. Why would you not at least test the market to see what other suitors are saying for you after you have yourself a great year. Maybe someone be out there. Maybe someone's out there and they're like, here's two years, $40 million, $45 million for you, Jack Peterson. So I would love for him to come back. I think it's 90% chance the D backs pick up Jack Peterson's option because of how good he was to the clubhouse, the lineup this year. But I think it's below 50 50. I think it's like 45% chance Jock side picks it up. 90% chance the D backs pick up their option, but I'm putting it below 50% Jock picks it up because despite the vibes and how much you might have liked Arizona this season, at the end of the day, you could just probably go out there and get more money if you're Jock Peterson. So I don't see why he wouldn't do that. Same with Randall Gritchick. He was so good this season and only like a six, seven million dollar option. Like, for the D-backs, like, again, it's probably, like, 95% chance they're going to try and pick it up. Like, Randall Gritchick, the production he gave you this season at that price tag. Again, like Merrill Kelly, who can you find who's going to give you that 875 OPS and be the clutches guy off the bench for you and can do a lot more in his role than what you allowed him to do this season than a Randall Gritchick at only $6, 7000000 million next season? I think Gritchick, again... D-back side, 90%, but for Gritchick's side, because the money's way lower than Jock Peterson, half of what, more than half less than what Jock Peterson's projected. Uh, Gritchick, I think it's only a 25% chance his side picks up the option because why would you, if you're Gritchick, after not getting a ton of playing opportunity, after having a great season, why wouldn't you go out there and test the open market? Then the final one, Scott McGuff, $4 million option. Uh, I think he's definitely picking up his side, right? Is that not 100,000%? If you're Scott McGuff and you could get $4 million next year, who is giving you $4 million if you're Scott McGuff? Probably nobody. He's probably a minor league contract. And so it's like 100% on his side. And for the D-backs, I want it to be zero, but I sneakily feel like they're like a 33% chance. Like they're still... A third of them is still like, should we bring back Scott McGuff? He's been in the system the last couple of years. Uh, may, maybe we could talk ourselves into uh, him rediscovering his form, whatever. I could just see the D-backs making a boneheaded move and trying to bring him back, but I don't think it's very likely. I would put the D-backs making that terrible decision at 33%. I don't think it's likely at all Scott McGuff's come back next year, but I don't think it's zero. 
Now we'll talk about Ketel Marte and do a little player review on his fantastic 2024 season in segment number three. But hey, if you're looking to plan an upcoming trip, then the place you're going to want to do, then the place you're going to want to go to do that is going to be Booking.com, booking dot, yeah. The right state can make you a fan of any city, even your baseball rivals. Book today on booking.com, the official accommodation partner of Major League Baseball. Explore all those U.S. cities you always want to secretly learn more about with hotels, bed and breakfast, vacation rentals, resorts, and so much more on booking.com. You might just find your perfect stay even in your baseball rival city during the postseason. No matter what team you're rooting for this postseason, Booking.com can make you a fan of any city with hotels that look over stadiums to family-friendly resorts. Check out Booking.com. Even your baseball rival city can make you a fan today, but only if you book through Booking.com. Booking. Yeah. All right, all right, all right. Let's get back into the Locked on Diamondbacks podcast and let's discuss Ketel Marte and his 2024 season as we've been doing all week on this podcast for the rest of the offseason where you will be doing player reviews on D-back skies for the rest of the offseason until I get some more interesting content with free agency and Things of that nature, but I do enjoy doing these player reviews. A good chance to look at the strengths and the weaknesses and set up goals and expectations for these guys in 2025. And now on today, we're going to be talking about the superstar Ketel Marte. What were his strengths and weaknesses from 2024? And then what does he need to do in 2025? Well, laying down the strengths for Ketel Marte, there are a lot because he had himself a fantastic year, right? Strengths. Anything that has to do with a bat and a ball, clutchness, power, ninth inning, leadoff, defense, Ketel Marte had himself a fantastic year, already ran through the traditional stats with the home runs, the OPS, the RBIs, we already know about that. But really, you go through any kind of split for Ketel Marte, and it shows you how dominant he was for the D-backs this season, power. Outside of just home runs, if you actually filter like we did with Christian Walker yesterday, right? We said he was like top 25, top 15 on a lot of those hard contact stats. You do Ketel Marte, he's like top 5 to 10 on like hard hit percentage, eggs of velocity, uh, stuff like that. Like Marte crushed the ball this season. And you might not expect Marte to be on the list like that because we all know he has power, but Typically, those kind of lists are like reserved for the judges and the Otanis and the Vlad Guerreros and like these big, stocky, typical, you know, corner infielders, maybe your first baseman or your third baseman. But you don't typically see it with your second baseman being one of the guys who have some of the most power in Major League Baseball. And that's where Ketel Marte is. Eighth in hard hit percentage this past year. Really incredible fifth in exit velocity as well and that's not just in the nl that's in major league baseball so Marte turned himself into a, a tremendous power bat this season uh, one of his biggest power seasons since that 2019 year where he finished top five in mvp voting i think we're going to get another top five mvp voting season this year for Marte. look at the clutch numbers Runners in scoring position, 320 average, 1074 OPS, high leverage moments, 339 average, 990 OPS. And of course, we know Marte, the ninth inning is where he thrived for some reason this year, but he absolutely loved it. So many times the D-backs backs were against the wall and Marte just came through for the squad. The first inning and the ninth inning. He bookended games with strong starts and powerful finishes because in the ninth inning this past year, he batted 395, a 414, a 1449, 1449 OPS in 19, uh, not 19 home runs, nine home runs, 19 RBIs, a fantastic ninth inning. And in the first inning, Ketel Marte, 360 average, 1219 OPS. 13 home runs, and again, 19 RBIs. He was tremendous in the first inning, and he was tremendous in the final inning. He was pretty good in those middle innings, but 
those two innings, he bookended games, strong starts, and powerful finishes. And he was also great as a leadoff hitter for the D-backs this season. We see the best teams in baseball, like the Dodgers, they put Otani as the leadoff hitter, right? They were doing it with Mookie as well. We see Schwarber bat leadoff for the Phillies. Well, that's what the D-backs did a ton with Ketel Marte this past year. And he thrives batting first. 314 average, 956 OPS when he's batting first. It's also 954 when he's batting second. So we know Marte overall, absolutely elite, right? Defense was good too. One of the best defensive second baseman in the sport this past season. So when we're looking at his profile from this past year in 2024, the strengths are flying off the page. Clutch, power, overall contact ability, like extra base hits, like really patience, like whatever you could name, Marte was great at. Not a lot of weaknesses. And so when talking about the weaknesses for Marte, they're not big weaknesses, but there are a couple things he can do to improve his overall game. And probably the biggest weakness he does have, he is not great against off-speed pitches. Against the fastball this past year, 632 slug. Against the breaking ball, 581 slug. But against the off-speed pitch, 377 slug. The power was not there against the off-speed. Overall contact ability, not there against the off-speed. Look at the hard contact stats, exit velo. He just not the same against the off-speed pitch. And so for him, the biggest weakness right now looking at his batting profile is that off-speed pitch. And if he can fix that, his game will just go to another level. If he can maybe slightly even out his numbers against the righties and the lefties, but it's not like it's it's not like his numbers are bad against one way or the other. Like Marte is like arguably the best hitter in baseball against left-handed pitching. If you look over the last like three, four years, like I don't think anyone in baseball has more home runs against left-handed pitching, including Aaron Judge, than Marte, who this past season, 342 average and a 1080 OPS against left-handed pitchers. And I'm saying against righties, I want him to just even it out a little bit. But even against righties, Marte still put up all-star numbers. He still had an 841 OPS against righties and a 260 average. So, like, he was still fine. 18 home runs in 123 games. He was still fine against righties. I just want him to see get a little bit better like how he is against lefties. And then finally, can he get a little bit more aggressive on the base pass? I don't need Marte to turn into Corbin Carroll, Jig McCarthy, but if I could get a mix between like a Perdomo and a Christian Walker, like I think Marte should be like a 10, 11 stolen base guy. I know the sprint speed isn't high when we look at StatCast, but from the eye test, you can't tell me Marte is slower than guys like Lords Guriel or some other players on this D backs team. I just don't think he's out there running full sprint all the time. But I think when he does hit that top speed, I don't think Marte is too slow. So I would like to see him get a little bit more aggressive on the base path. So saying his strengths and weaknesses, what do we need from Marte in 2025? Just like what we need from Christian Walker. Can you just replicate what you did this past year? Your 2022, or excuse me, your 2023 season was good. But what you did in 2024, you went to another level. You established yourself once again as the best second baseman in the sport this year. You're going to more than likely finish top five in MVP voting. Like Marte, if you took out Otani and if Marte played 160 games, he very well could have won the MVP this past season. And that's the kind of year I need from him again in 2025. Now, that's it for this edition of the Locked on Dimebacks podcast. Come back tomorrow for more Dimebacks news coverage insight. And as always, stay safe, stay healthy. Dose it.